back to Earth at the biggest delay of any Red Dwarf. There was a full nine years between Series 8 and this. And just to be confusing, there was an Unseen Ninth series, which in the show totally happened, but doesn't exist. A series where Kachansky apparently died. So we have Series 1 to 8, which did happen, Series 9, which happened off-screen, back to Earth, and then Series 10 and on. I've read somewhere that at some point there was a plan to go back and make Series 9, but I don't know if that's the case. If they did plan it, they didn't do it. Why was there such a delay? Well, Doug Naylor spent the better part of a decade trying to get a Red Dwarf movie off the ground. It was going to be about killer cyborgs that had destroyed the human race and were now after the Red Dwarf crew. I don't know if it was going to be set in the same continuity as the rest of the show, but does it really matter at this point? The BBC decided that it didn't want any more Red Dwarf after Series 8. Understandable, really. They never much cared for Psy finally kept producing the earlier series because it was one of BBC Two's biggest hits. The 10-year wait gave them an excuse to not bother anymore. So in steps Dave, a digital channel that's actually partially owned by the BBC, which mainly exists to show repeats of classic British comedy. Back to Earth was one of their first forays into producing their own stuff. It was a three-episode experiment to see if people wanted more Red Dwarf. And what do you know? They did. Back to Earth is essentially Red Dwarf does Blade Runner. The references are so numerous that I can't mention them all. If you've seen Blade Runner, just keep your eyes out. If you haven't, just assume the random stuff has something to do with Blade Runner. There's also some stuff about the soap opera Coronation Street that Craig Charles was starring in at the time. But I refuse to become an expert on that show for this video, so take whatever I say with a grain of salt. Doug Naylor's writing and directing and we open nine years later. The classic original Red Dwarf is back. Like Series 7, this was filmed without an audience, basically like a film. And as you can already see, the whole visual aesthetic has changed. CGI had got so cheap that many of the walls and even the scudders are digital. Talking of scudders, that's Bob the Scudder from Series 8, last seen being eaten by a T-Rex. And he's now being mo by Danny John Jules. Crichton's off on holiday, he wanted to travel, so he's disassembled himself in a cupboard on the other side of the ship. As Crichton's away, let's just do the ironing with his own sneezes. <laughs> Don't suppose you want any iron doing, do you? Annoying Rimmer is just a plus. Lister heads off to a memorial on the edge of the ship. We see George McIntyre, the hologram from the pilot, Mel Bibby, the Series 3 to 8 production designer, the first major part of the Red Dwarf extended family to die, and Kachansky. He's reading her photos from Jane Austen. It's a nice scene. Pity it's interrupted by a sopping wet pussy. He was grabbed by a tentacle from a local water tank and only barely escaped with seven of his lives. Oh great, Crichton made it back. Now they have a full cast for fighting the sea monster. Now, this is apparently the original hologram Rimmer, not the Series 8 human Rimmer having died and become a hologram. Do they ever explain what happened? No, like with everything else that happened between Series 8 and this, they have fun making it as confusing as possible. At least they explain Holly's absence. Lister left a bath running for nine years and his mainframe's flooded. Now, originally they wanted Norman Lovett back, but there was some serious acrimony and he says he'll never return. Maybe one day we'll get lucky and Hattie Hayridge, aka Superior Holly, will make a comeback. One odd thing is that Cat seems to be much more catty than usual. All screeches, dance walking, and refusing to be helpful. Hey, I'm a cat. Nobody bosses Mr. C around, buddy. In short, like he was in series one and two. Anyway, three of them take a canary diving bell down into the water tank to deal with the monster. I'm really not sure what the plan was, because the second they actually meet it, it goes pretty badly. After a bit of a scuffle, they're in the bell back up with one of the squid's tentacles. Crime deduces that the squid was some kind of dimension-hopping monster and that was hibernating. It vanishes in a burst of light and a new hard light hologram appears. My name is Katerina Bartikovsky. She was a member of the Red Dwarf crew and she's played by Sophie Winkleman, a very minor member of the extended royal family. She married one of the Queen's cousin's sons. Her formal name is Lady Frederick Windsor. You might think that's weird, but her mother-in-law is Princess Michael of Kent. It's royal stuff, don't ask. Anyway, she's here to replace Rimmer because he's been a bit of a shit hologram slash superior officer. But the effect this has on the plot is fairly negligible. In my country, we have word for people like you. In my country, we have several. Katarina is planning on using the Dimension Squid's tentacle to open a doorway to an alternate reality. So Lister can find a mate and save the human race. Lister will travel to a new dimension, bring back a mate, and recreate human race, yes? At best, that would buy them a few centuries of hideous inbreeding. Great work, science lady. Costume-wise, Rimmer's wearing a blue version of a Series 3 and 4 tunic. 
They tried the Quilted Series 5 to 7 one, but apparently looked a bit crap in HD. Lister's actually wearing the same old leather jacket from Series 3. I only mention that because Craig Charles was really pleased that he could still fit into it. Anyway, part one ends with Katarina successfully opening the Bifrost, discovering that the reality is not valid, and opening a portal to the nearest valid reality. Ooh, intrigue. And ooh, dodgy special effects. They get sucked through and land in a TV showroom that's playing copies of Red Dwarf, Back to Earth. Science fiction. It's all a bit bollocks, really, isn't it? Kat's costume is new, based on the Riviera Kid from Gunman of the Apocalypse. And they got so good at Crichton's makeup by this point, that it took just 90 minutes to get him into it. At the start of Series 3, it was six hours. Anyway, in the shop, they find some copies of Red Dwarf for sale and work out the horrible truth. Their adventures are being sold for very cheap, and that they're fictional. That's why their dimension was invalid. I'm not real. That explains so much. I'm not real either. Does that mean I'm not really this good looking? <laughs> the back of the Back to Earth DVD says they're going to search at their creator, who better be called Grant Naylor or I swear to cloister the stupid they're going to break something, to plead for more life, more series as. Figuring the DVD knows more than they do, they go along with what it says. The first stop is a sci-fi shop. A real sci-fi shop playing itself. Dimension skid, was it? Happens a lot this time of year. One minute you're fine, the next... You're in a new dimension. Gotta be so careful. Well, that's an unfunny and really insulting parody of your fans to have in a thing where you're literally begging for more episodes. I approve of that chutzpah. Listening to music. No, why? Through a brilliantly convoluted parody of the Enhance the Image scene from Blade Runner, they find the address of a prop master involved in the show, a guy named Swallow, who specialises in creating noses. He's a parody of Chew. To get there, they need to brave the dangers of the bus. Lister sees an article on Chloe Annette, play Kachansky. It's a fake article, seeing as she's not been famous enough to get that kind of spread since the 90s. These aren't her kids either, they're Howard Burden's, the long-term Red Dwarf costume designer's kids. You're Dave Lister, aren't you? <laughs> now these kids watch Red Dwarf and Dave. They assume the channel's named after him. Which, thinking about it, it might be. This is a very weird scene. These kids are here to give him a pep talk. You're pretty cool. Cool? You don't take any smeg. That's cool. And they're so young that the only bit of Red Dwarf that they're old enough to have even seen is Back to Earth. All the other series are 12 or PG-13 if you're American. Okay, fine, they watch it anyway, but they're so young slash stupid that they don't realise that the show's not real. They saw him and assumed he was Dave Lister, a man from the future instead of the guy who played him. You're Dave Lister, aren't you? <laughs> and on top of that, there's no jokes. It's played entirely straight. They think Kachansky's still alive, that Crichton lied about her death to spare his feelings. She is not really dead. Crichton made it up. Well, if there was an actual subplot about that, the audience would have seen what happened to her one way or another. She is not really dead. Crichton made it up. Or, you know, he murdered her. Hey, I'll stop! Tell Rimmer he's a smeggin! He's on the bus too. Go tell him yourself. Katarina made it through the portal and tracked them down, only to be murdered by Rimmer because they don't have time for that subplot. Come on, we haven't got all day. And with a minute to swallow, who seems to be wearing a simulant. How many episodes have we got left? Is it true we're going to die? I don't know that stuff. I just do notice. They get an address from him in Steele's car, the most expensive piece of Red Dwarf memorabilia yet devised. The budget didn't stretch to buying a smart car to be turned into car bug, so Doug Naylor bought it with his own money and donated it to the production. Where are they headed? To Coronation Street the soap opera that Craig Charles was acting in at the time. Now, this sort of crossover was just a bit unthinkable in Red Dwarf's BBC days, as Coronation Street is a flagship show on ITV, their biggest rival. So that's good, if you like Coronation Street, which I don't. Why couldn't they have gone searching for Danny John Jules in the set of Blade 2, or Maid Marion under Merry Man? Apart from the timing being very off. Funny story, when filming this, they got the keys locked up in the car, and when they called to get help, everyone assumed it was a prank call. I'm pretty sure they had to break in in the end. Is it just like where I grew up, except there's less burning cars? Craig Charles is in the Rover's Return, the pub from the show, learning his lines. Simon Greggs, another Coronation Street actor, spots the crew and warns him that stuff is getting weird. How many have you had? Well, I've had a couple, but listen, I've just seen you. You're the only one that can help us, man. I know you don't exist. Okay, no need to rub it in. 
They want the critters address to find out exactly how many episodes they have left and to get more. You see, Back to Earth Episode 3 is planned as the final episode. Craig Charles kind of knows what's going on because we've been working Back to Earth, though he's still waiting for a script for Episode 3. The timing's a bit weird, though, because of all the posters and displays. That stuff doesn't usually happen until you get your completed script. Unless the scripts are very late, which they often were with Red Dwarf, so I'll shut up. I'm so glad I'm not him. The guy's a wreck. And pretend to be somebody else all day. That's no way to make a living. Smeg it. They finally get Grant Miller's address, though they could have just looked out for the cyber hellscape pyramid and missed out on all that runaround. I'm also pretty sure that if the creator of Red Dwarf could afford to own that, he could have financed the film himself. And away here is Grant Naylor himself, complete with bullets with their names on them. Visitors, sir. The little munchkin rimmers are back! Oh, <clears throat> sorry, I got a bit excited there. He says that he's grown weary of them. That might be channeling Rob Grant a bit. And it's time for them to die. They throw out ideas for possible spin-offs, but it doesn't work. I'd even do a sitcom, anything, anything to stay alive. Oh, my poor dear, you did. He describes their deaths, they run, and he gives chase through Chinatown before gunning them down in a rain of shattered glass and fake snow. Sad. And beautiful. But just different enough to a famous film to avoid legal trouble. They grab the gun and force him to write them a happy ending on the pain of death. But he gets it back through some clever writing. But not as clever as the Lister crushing his head. And he's dead dead because he lied about their deaths and wrote his own murder into the script. With their crater dead, they will cease to exist. Lister tears the next few pages from the script and takes over the typewriter. Now he has the power. That's why Rimmer's dancing like an idiot and violently raping a table. And why Crichton's doing a worse version of the sideshow Bob Rake bit from The Simpsons. No one ever said Lister had a good sense of humor. Anyway, Lister stops writing and the scene continues and they realize that something else must be in charge. A squid. Just like the things Kat's been making ever since they arrived on Earth. It's a subconscious warning that they're in a dreamscape thanks to the squid. Just like in Back to Reality. Back to Reality, Back to Earth. I don't know how they did it, but this obvious retread is actually pretty clever when it's a twist ending. Lister's not feeling despair though, he's elated, and Kachansky's approaching. The others vanish, they broke out of the dream, while Lister drives off with Kachansky to have an experience that's sure to be better than life. The novel. But in time, he realizes that the real Kachansky is out there, waiting for him to find her, and if little kids on a bus can believe in him, then maybe he's cool enough for her after all. I'm pretty cool. I don't take any smeg. And even though I'm disgusting, sometimes I can be quite brave. You're pretty cool. You don't take any smeg. That's cool. And even though you're disgusting, sometimes you're quite brave. This is nowhere near as sweet as it sounds, but I'll discuss Kachansky in a couple of minutes. The squid was female, that's why the ink induced elation rather than despair. Because science. How'd she get on board? Cat brought her on board after Back to Reality with the intention of eating her. I'm gonna eat you little fishy, cause I like little fish. The only problem with that is Series 7 said Red Dwarf was stolen while they're on the planet in Back to Reality. So unless Cat had her stuck up his ass for literally hundreds of years, this doesn't make any sense. But like I said many times before, it's easier to assume that Red Dwarf jumps to a parallel reality every couple of series. Anyway, they conclude that the people in the other reality will continue to exist as though they're real, as a result of being created by the delusion. Well, they'll continue to exist as a consequence of us creating them in our hallucination certs, quantum mechanics. You know, fictional characters entering reality and seeking out their creators is nothing new. But them doing all that, returning to their reality and concluding that we're the fictional ones, that is new. So good work. I can see why a lot of people don't seem to like this. It's one of the last funny pieces of the show. By design, like Series 7, it's a comedy drama. And it's built at a fan service for something else. After nine years of waiting, those who only wanted more Red Dwarf were bound to feel somewhat cheated. I try to take it on its own merits, and it's fine. Anyway, I'd say Back to Earth was a successful experiment. Granted, it's weird seeing the characters jump in age so much between series is, and the complete new visual style is a little jarring, but overall, this is a far more successful three-parter than back in the red. I do have a question, though. Was Katrina real or part of the delusion? Like, was she created to replace Rimmer, like she said, and instantly join the dream, or was she part of the dream? It's not a big deal, but if she is real, that means the ship can run multiple holograms, which makes the idea that Kachansky's dead transparently bullshit right from the start. Because if she's dead, where's her hologram? How come there are two holograms active, both hard light? 
I thought the ship could only sustain one. How does Lister pass time? Now, like I said earlier, I tend to view Red Dwarf as a show with several eras. There's the sitcom era, series 1 and 2, the golden era, series 3 to 6, the dark age, series 7 and 8, and there's back to earth on, the Dave or Fool's Gold era. Not because it's worthless, but because it's a lot like the golden era, but not as good. If you slipped a random series 10, 11 or 12 episode into series 3 to 6, it would almost fit. The writing's not as funny or clever or imaginative, but it only registers a less good episode for that series. Anyway, before I finish, I'd like to discuss Kachansky now that she's well and truly gone. Naylor really cocked up with her. In Series 1, she was an unattainable symbol for Lister to hold on to. She helped keep him focused, to keep him sane. Then she becomes his ex, and Lister suddenly becomes a little less pathetic. I don't like the change, but that's fine. Then Series 7 happened and the weird rot set in. She arrives from the alternate reality and she brought drama. Not in the high school sense, but in the she has her own agenda sense. She doesn't want to bum around the cosmos, she just wants to go home. Then at some point, Naylor got tired of the scripting challenge he'd set himself, and the alternate reality origin was pretty much forgotten. She no longer wanted to get home, she didn't care about her crew or her probable husband, and became a team player. Then in series 8, we get proof that her alternate reality origin was definitely forgotten. Kachansky wasn't recreated by the nanomachines. She assumed her alternate self's place, and no one cared that she's not there Kachansky. Even her unseen ex that she allegedly went on a date with. She also became the chick. With the bigger cast, she was reduced to being a stereotype and sometimes an object. Early in Series 7, she was furious, smart, and could handle herself. In Series 8, she is a stuffed rabbit and has period jokes chucked at her. In Series 7, she easily defeated a Gelf cruiser. In Series 8, she was filmed naked. You could argue that she was treated in the same broad, cartoony way that the others were in Series 8, and you would be right. The difference is that Kachansky was brought in to shake things up, to do something different. And then that happened. Naylor failed so badly at what he tried to do in Series 7 that he went the opposite direction in Series 8 and created something that would have been sexist a few decades earlier. Then Back to Earth happens, Kachansky's gone, Lister believes she's dead, but he finds out that she's alive. Miss Kachansky's not dead, sir. I, I lied to you, sir. She dumped you. I, I was trying to protect you. She she's out there somewhere out there waiting for him. She's become a symbol again, like in series one. But she's also an object, something to be found. After decades, she ended up where she began, but worse off. It's hard to put into words exactly how badly Naylor mishandled the character of Kachansky in the show. And I'm not a Kachansky fan feeling like she got a raw deal. I don't even think she works in series seven. But most things after Chloe Annette takes over are just examples of someone who realizes that he's made a mistake trying to fix it, and somehow making it worse. Here's the sad part about Back to Earth. Crichton could have just explained that Kachansky found a way back to her reality. Her lister and he lied to save his feelings. It would make much more sense and be a hell of a lot more dramatic than what we got. She, she's out there somewhere. Anyway, that was Back to Earth. See you soon for Series 10. Mm -hmm.